this Father's Day, celebrate the dad in your life with a special event. And come on down to the Rooster Tail, located in downtown on the beautiful Detroit River, for a Father's Day luncheon that he won't forget. There'll be great food, there'll be giveaways, there'll be prizes, and outstanding entertainment. So stop searching and go online to eventbrite.com. That's eventbrite.com. And look for our Father's Day luncheon at the Rooster Tail. Get your tickets. guess over 20 years ago when we both worked in the same investigative unit. He is a great human being, friend, leader, athlete, and dad. He has raised two responsible young adults, and I'm going to be talking with him about raising biracial children. My guest today is Dale Christian. Hi, Dale. Thanks for uh, joining us. Well, Sarah, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. All right, I'll start off with basic questions so we can get to know who you are. My first question is, where were you born? I was born in uh, Christian St. Croix in the United States Virgin Islands. Okay, and you grew up there as well? Yes, um, those were where I spent my formative years, as they say. I um, attended my grade school and my high school there. Um, both were parochial schools. And then I moved to Detroit in 1974 when I graduated from high school. Um, lived there with my sister, who was living here in Detroit at the time, and attended Wayne State, and then later on transferred to Michigan State. Now, what brought your sister from the nice warm weather in the Virgin Islands to the well, four season Detroit, Michigan? <laughs> I guess just per chance she had married a guy from Detroit who was in the military in New Jersey. Okay. And um, they met, got married, and they moved back to Detroit where he was from. Okay. All right. So uh, you have one sister you just told us about. Do you have other siblings? I do. I have uh, three other sisters, um, one that lives in Lansing, one that lives at home in the Virgin Islands, and another one that lives right now in Virginia. And I have a sister, another sister that passed away about six years ago. Oh, sorry. So you are the only male. Child. I am the only and the youngest, but I was never spoiled by my folks. You were never spoiled? No. Wow. They did not spare the rod. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what did your parents do for a living? Uh, at one time, my mom was a receptionist for a doctor. Um, his name was Melvin Evans. And he was the last appointed governor of the Virgin Islands. And the governor at the time was appointed by the president of the United States. When he got appointed governor, he brought her on as his personal secretary. Okay. Um, after the first election, when we were able to vote for our own governor, he won. He stayed on. She stayed on with him. The second um, independent election, a gentleman by the name of Cyril King won the election from the independent party. And he decided to keep her on there, too. So she was the personal secretary to the governor and also what would be the administrator of St. Croix, who would be sort of like the mayor here in Detroit. Okay. My father, um, he was a carpenter by trade. And when he retired, he was a supervisor in the Department of uh, Public Works. Okay. All right. So you think your parents were just trying and trying until they got a boy, and that's how you ended up here since they had all these girls before you? <laughs> well, he was 41 when he had me, so I guess that's probably part of the plan. <laughs> um, and I neglected to mention, you know, you say I was the only boy. Actually, the first born in the family was a boy, but he died as an infant, so I never knew, never knew him or anything like that. Oh, okay, sir. So, yeah, he probably kept trying. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so are you and your siblings close? You and your sisters really close? Um, close in terms of, you know, contact on a regular basis or every day or something like that? No. Um, except with my sister in Lansing. She is 10 years older than I and the one that's closest to me in age. Uh, okay. My next sister after that is like 20 years older. And the other one, and the oldest sister is like 27 years older. So they're significantly older than I. So growing up, I never really knew them because they weren't around. 
Um, well, only my house. sister that lives in Lansing was the one closest to me growing up. So her and I became quite close. Okay. So do any of your sisters have children? Yes. My um, oldest sister, the one that still lives in the islands, she has three. <laughs> she has a boy. His name is also Delman. Um, his name is Delman Gerard. And then two girls, one that lives at home and one that lives in Baltimore. My second sister, she has one boy, and he was in the Air Force, and he has his own kids, and he's actually a grandfather now. Wow. <laughs> so, and he lives in Virginia, which is where they moved to. And then yeah. my sister in Lansing had two boys. Um, the first one died as, died very young, and I think he was like about a year old. And then she has another son right now also, and he is in his 40s. Okay. So your other sisters were other in other states, but you chose to come here to cold Detroit, Michigan and live. Um, why'd you choose Michigan? Well, it's a long story. I and mean, the set, part A is my sister lives here. Part B is a girl. <laughs> so <laughs> I, um, during my high school years, there was a girl in my class. Um, she was originally from Detroit, and she moved to the islands to live with her aunt and uncle when she was, like, in the second grade. So we were always in the same class together. And during high school, we saw each other for a little while. And when we graduated, and she graduated valedictorian, I graduated salutatorian of our high school class. And her and I decided we're going to apply to the same universities. So we applied to Yale, Rollins, and Wayne State. And we got accepted to all three. And between her and I, we decided, well, it's going to be Wayne State because you have your family back there and everything else like that. And uh, that was our decision. Her folks' decision was, no, no, you're going to go to Yale. <laughs> Me, I said, well, I have my sister there in, um, in Detroit. I'm going to go to Wayne State. Yes, That's how I ended up here. My other sister was also living in cold weather states. Um, one was living in New York, one was living in New Jersey, and my my younger my young youngest sister, the one that's just closest to me, mm -hmm. um, she was living in California and had just moved back home. So. Oh, okay, okay. So coming from the U.S. Virgin Islands to Michigan, tell us about the way you were perceived about people when they heard your accent. <laughs> When I first got here, it was, people did not understand me. <laughs> I spoke fast because we speak very fast in the islands and we cut our words short. And so I had to slow everything down, repeat myself several times just for people to understand me. Um, I, I mean, that's how we spoke in the islands. Okay. We grew up, we learned kids English, you know, because that's what we were taught. With by the nuns, but when we spoke amongst ourselves, we spoke what we call crucian. Uh, Give me an Troy. example of, uh, like you say, I'm about to go to the store. I'm about to drive. Okay. If, if I was supposed to say um, I'm going to the store, I'm going to the store. Okay, that's not bad. I understand that. Yeah, but when you're saying it really fast and with a uh, I, it's a heavier accent, you know, because now it's kind of tame. Okay. Uh, at first, it was it was kind of frustrating because people didn't understand. What did you say? Say that again, you know. So, so I learned to slow everything down and speak more, I guess, more proper English, okay. which also created an issue because wow. a lot of African Americans in the area didn't consider me like a full African-American, even though I'm black, because of the way I spoke. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did they think you were from uh, another country, basically? Well, yeah, they knew I was from another country. Most of the time, they'd say Jamaica. Okay. You know, and I said, no, I'm not from Jamaica. I'm from the Virgin Islands. And at times, they had no idea where that was or, or that it even existed. And they'd ask, why well, you're a citizen? Well, yes, I'm born a citizen. It's a U.S. territorial possession, just like Puerto Rico or Guam or some of the other territorial possessions of the United States. So you have to explain, you had to explain a lot at first. You don't now, right? 
I'm sorry, say that again. You had to explain people, yes, I'm American. Yes, I had to give them a geography lesson. I know. <laughs> And but now, you know, it's not you don't have to do it maybe as often if you do have to do it at all. I know very much so I'm understood now when I speak the first time around, okay. unless I have a couple of Heineken's. Then my accent comes out a little bit. <laughs> okay. What about your siblings? Did they experience it as well? Well, let's see. My um Oldest sister, the one that still lives in the islands, she I would say probably not. She went to Loyola University in Chicago for nursing. And she married a guy from home. And he was he was Puerto Rican. Um my second sister, um, not the one that married a guy from Detroit, that's the one that's passed away. Um the other sister married a guy from St. Thomas, our sister island. Mm -hmm. So again, that was cultural. And my sister closest to me married her high school boyfriend. So they didn't really have to mix with others because especially in the East Coast, New York and New Jersey, there's a lot of Caribbean people there. Okay. So they had like a, a good cultural base that they could yeah. get with. We also had a lot of family in that area. Um, okay. My mother's sisters, two of her three sisters lived in New York. Okay. So I would come up to the, to New York in the summertime or New Jersey where my other sister lived. And that's where I spent most of my summers during my high school year. Okay. Around family. Right? Around family, yes. So you're applying for jobs and this happens. People try to tell you, you know, are you, ask, are you, you know, are you American? You're applying for this job, blah, 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 blah. Um, you No, you know, um, when I came, my, my main focus, my main focus was school. Okay. Um, I was lucky enough, and I have to say I was blessed because when I moved to Detroit, there was a family three doors down from where my sister and I lived. And they're a black family. And they kind of adopted me like their son. Oh. Um, they had two boys and two girls. I would have been the oldest. <laughs> I was um, 17 when I moved here. And um, Brian would have been 60, and then they had a girl, a boy and a girl. But anyway, so they kind of took me in as one of their own. I mean, literally took me in as one of their own. They, I went to their church. Um, I went to their family functions. Um, when I transferred to Michigan State, if I came back down for the weekend, that was where I stayed. You know, even if I was in Detroit for any reason, that's where that's where I was because they were like my family. They just literally adopted me. Okay, so your dad was a carpenter. You went to college. You got your degree in what? In criminal justice. Okay, so why didn't you follow in your dad's footstep or your mom's footstep and go into government? What made you choose law enforcement? When I was in my young years, you know, you're watching television as a kid, and Ephraim Zimblis Jr. <laughs> on The Fugitive from the FBI. Okay. okay. That, that show, The Fugitive, got me interested in law enforcement. In all actuality, <clears throat> when I first came to Wayne State, I was studying pre-veterinary medicine to transfer to Michigan State. Okay. When I got to Michigan State, I continued my pre-veterinary courses but I still had that hankering for law enforcement. So I remember taking a couple months off and telling my mom, you know, that I'm gonna change and go into law enforcement, that kind of stuff. And she was, she was a little disappointed, but she said, you know, you have to do what you have to do. So in my senior year, I applied at the Michigan State Police Department because I was told years ago that it takes a long time to get into the department. Well, I applied in, I want to say like September of my senior year, October, I got a call that said, you know, hey, you're scheduled for the written exam. I took the written exam. Um, like January or so, they contacted me again and said, okay, you need to come for your physical. <laughs> I went for the physical. Then they did my background investigation and they said, um, okay, it's now April. Um, we have a school starting next week. You're in. Wow. Then the week before the school started, they called me and said they canceled the, the academy. 
So there I was. So I had actually dropped out of, of Michigan State at the time because I was going to the academy. I was going to go. Then they called me back again in June. And I remember the phone call quite well. The guy says, uh, you still interested in coming to the academy? And this was a Thursday. And I said, well, of course. He says, great, because we start on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had to go out really quick, buy all my gear, buy all my khakis and everything else like that. Go get my hair cut because I had a big throw at the time. Go get my hair cut and everything to go into the academy. Wow. And you started and stayed how many years? Uh, I did 32 years. I retired in 2011. Um, and it was a great 32 years. So I, I loved it. I, I loved the 32 years. I especially liked my last 16 years when I was actually working at Detroit Police Headquarters with the Violent Crime Task Force. And we enjoyed working with you too. So yeah. during that 32 years, um, something, and you said, hey, I think I want to get married and start a family. Is that right? <laughs> well, when I came to Michigan, the church I was going to, um, there was a young lady there who caught my fancy. <laughs> and um, so she was she was quite a bit young. She was four years young, you know, so we really didn't start seeing each other because at the time she would have been 13. I would have been 17. You can't do, mm -hmm. really do that, you know. Right. But as she got older, we started dating, and then she ended up going to Michigan State also. Okay. So when I was leaving Michigan State, she was actually just coming in. But we continued dating during her um, her college years. And after she graduated from college with her degree in social science, I believe it is, um, or was, um, she, I was living in Pawpaw at the time, which was my first post for the state police. She came out there and we got married. Wow. Okay. But she's not the mother of your kids, correct? No, she is not. Um, as it turned out, she was unable to have children. Oh. Um, and then we moved back to the Detroit area. Uh, I got transferred back in 84. And we ended up getting divorced. Oh. And um, I met another another lady, and I had my two children with her. Okay. So how did you meet your second wife? The mom how did I meet her? Yes. How did you meet her? Did somebody introduce you to her? or? Oh, no. That's the matter of fact. I was sitting at a local bar having a beer and these two girls walk in and she sat next to me at the bar and the other girl sat on her other side, on her right side. And um, and I said, hi, cause I'm that kind of a guy. And she says, hi. And that was it for a second. And then a, another guy came in and sat on my left. And um, I said, um, I turned to her again. So what brings you here? She goes, oh, my friend here has to give this guy that's now on my left a book. And I said, oh, okay. So I says, can I buy you a drink? And she goes, no, and turns around and just turns away. And I go like, what a, <clears throat> you know, and left it at that. <laughs> so the guy gets up, goes around, and sits next to the girl he's getting the book from. They're having long-term conversations. She's just sitting there. So then she decided to have conversation with me. And that's how we met. Okay. So she piqued your fancy eventually, and you guys decided to get married? Yeah. Actually, she <laughs> she had moved to Arizona. Uh, she's a teacher, and she moved to Arizona to teach. So her, her girlfriend that was there and another young lady, they were all teachers, all moved to Arizona. And um, I went out there one October for a visit, and... Um, Spend my I spent like 10 days there. They came back and um, she flew back at the end of the school year and then we decided to get married. Wow. Wow. Okay. So um, you decide to get married. Um, where are you living at? Where did you decide? Did you live in Detroit or you? Well, I, I currently live in, in, in Livonia. Um, which was where I was when we met and um, had a house here. Nice, beautiful neighborhood, great neighbors. Um, they're all white, <laughs> but they're all good people, you know. 
And so, and my current wife, oh, my wife at the time then, that she's white. Uh, my first wife was black. Um, but she's white. And but yeah, we she moved in here. And again, we had great neighbors, had a good time, and we decided, yep, yeah, time to have some children. So we had two kids. Okay. By now, then I was I was 41. You were what how old? 41 when I had my first kid. Okay. So normally when people get married and they decide to have kids, you know, it will purchase a house. They say, hmm, the school system. And the neighborhood, but especially the school system. But you had already lived there. So your mind says that this is okay to raise my kids. This uh, particular neighborhood and this particular school system would be good enough for my children. Because normally when people buy a house, when, they, when they're bringing kids into the world, they're like, we've got to make sure that the school system is top notch. And I mean, you did consider that prior to, right? Well, yes and no. Um... When I purchased the house, I didn't have any kids. I was right. not married. So that was not a great concern of mine at the time. Right. With her being a teacher, she knew that the Livonia school system was a good school system. Okay. So she was happy to have to keep the kids here. Okay. And um, they both went to Livonia schools uh -huh. and uh, graduated, went to college, and they're both doing fine. Okay. And, and, and I know the Livonia school system at the time, and I have to say at the time, was not the most integrated system, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but over time, when it, by the time they got to high school, it had become quite integrated, at least the schools they were attending. Um, they had kids there from pretty much every culture you could think of, uh, you know, so... It wasn't like they were like sticking out like sore thumbs because they were African Americans. Okay, all right. Um, who do you believe influenced you as a dad? I mean, did you have? You said you moved in with a family next door, to, were a few doors down from your sister, so you had that male figure. You had your dad. Um, were there any other males that influenced you when you thought about becoming a father? No, I don't think so. I think my dad was the most influential. Um, he did things with me. And my mom also had a, a big influence on my life to be in becoming a parent and, and how to take care of the kids. Um, my mom, because she was the governor's personal secretary, many days she'd call at like 3.30 or 4. She goes, hey, I'm not going to make it home tonight to fix dinner. So my dad and I fended for ourselves. That's how I learned to cook. One of the other things she did was she made me very independent in that she taught me how to sew. She taught me how to crochet. You know, that might sound like girly things. <laughs> and especially with the sewing part, it would, that was when you sewed off of a pattern, you know. But I used to make my own shirts and what? stuff like that. So that was fine. And my dad, he was also very, I, I want to say, I don't want to say forward thinking. But our culture is very male dominant, mm -hmm. but he was different because he would let my mom control the purse strings. Really? You know, yeah. You know, and again, and he would cook, you know, and both him and I would clean around the house, you know, so that my mom didn't have to do everything, you know. Right. And so I, I think they're both very influential in how I raised my kids. Because I raised them to be very independent. I remember one year, they were quite young. They may have been like 10 years old. I think Delton was 10 and my daughter was like seven, seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And because I was doing the cooking, um, I they bought me a cookbook. <laughs> and I go, oh, good. Here's what we're going to do. Every week, one of you are going to pick a recipe and you're going to cook it. I'll go buy the ingredients, but you're cooking it. Wow. And it worked quite well for well over a year. Okay. You know, so now they can both cook. You know, they oh, both yeah. did it, started doing their own laundry when they were very young. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, no, we're not doing your laundry. You can do your laundry, sort the clothes. Here's a, here's a washer, put them in. Here's a dryer, put them in. You know, and so again, and they're very independent. They're out there and they're doing their thing. That's good. That's good. 
So, um, did you realize that you have learned more from your dad than you knew was possible once you started, you know, raising your kids, your mommy? I mean, the information that you have and the method that you use to raise them, did you realize how much information you had took in from your dad and your mom? Well, you know, not. I'm not at first, but as you okay. as your kids are growing and you start dealing with them, you try you remember how you were dealt with, you know, like I get I mentioned before, you know, they didn't spoil or, or they didn't spare the rod, you right. know, I never really spanked my kids. Oh, they got smacked a couple of times, but they, it wasn't like, you know, like the spankings I used to get. <laughs> I had some whooping. So, but, what? But no, but they got some hands put to them every once in a while because they deserved it and they needed it, you know, to so they can re, so the action can be reinforced that this is not how you behave, you know. And so that's one of all things I'm always proud of is we could go to a restaurant and people would actually comment about how well behaved they were, really? and that made me proud, you know, as a dad, you know. I said, yep, that's how they are. You go on a <laughs> long road trip or something like that, they'd be in the car. And you won't hear them bickering with each other like some siblings do. Right. You know, you don't hear that we're there yet. You know, they're either back there reading or, you know, watching a video or something. But again, they were just well-behaved kids. And, uh, and, and they still are. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. We had a couple of issues along the line. You know, mm -hmm. I had one that was smoking a little weed, you know, way back then in high school. You know, mm -hmm. I had one that got a little caught shoplifting. You know, but she paid her penalty. You know, she had to do uh, community service and all this kind of stuff at a, at a senior home. So yeah, so they weren't perfect kids, but they were good kids. Because I mean, knowing that you're law enforcement, you would think that you know, my dad's a cop. I can't do anything wrong. You know, I have to be perfect. But they they just remain human. You know, and said. My, I want to have friends and I want to be with my friends and, you know, I'm going to follow that route until they got caught. And that, that, I, that, I, that I one mistake it. was it. I'm sorry? That, peer pressure, that one mistake for each one of them, that peer pressure, once you got a, a, a wind of it, it just stopped the nonsense or the decisions making, I guess, toward follow the crowd. Well, yeah, uh, you know, and, and I guess that a lot of it is peer pressure. But uh, I remember when, when my son, when I found out my son was, was, was smoking a little bit in high school. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we found out, we got him home, we went and got a, a drug test, you know, a, a test kit. And we tested him, and of course, he came back positive. And we took the box and we put it on top of the refrigerator. And we said, don't ever let me have to test you again. And we will test you randomly. The test kit is right there. He didn't know it. I go, and if you come back positive, you're gonna have hell to pay. That was enough, you know, just to know that. Now nah, I, I better not, you know. So, right. But but again, they they turned out to be good kids. So. Okay. All right. So when they were young, um, because you know you look different from them, did you have to answer? Did they have questions about? what people were saying and anybody come, you know, cause they're ignorant. They don't know. Kids don't know. Sometimes adults are ignorant too. You know, uh, as we can see today where, you know, if a black person is in a restaurant with some white children, you know, there may be a person that, you know, called the police and said, you know, they shouldn't be together or something like that. Did you have any of those issues? Did your kids have issues with the ignorance of other, you know, others not knowing, that you know you can have a biracial family. No, I I don't think so. I think my my kids were they're, they're kind of there. I mean, I I they knew of the Caribbean culture, you know, because we went back to the islands quite a bit, <clears throat> and because their schooling, I think, because they were predominantly white schools at the mm -hmm. time when they were in their younger years, you know, they I think they just learned how to get along with with other kids. Today they have kids of they're friends of both races, okay. you know, and they all hang out together. I, the the kids today, the younger kids and, you know, the, the young adults, I think today are a lot more tolerant 
of race, sexuality, sexual orientation, and so forth than our generation was. Yes. And so I think, <clears throat> excuse me, so I think it's a little easier for them, or was easier for them growing up in that generation. I mean, when I first, um, not when I first came to Michigan, well, I guess when I first came to Michigan, um, the church that the family took me to, and again, it was a black family, was a predominantly white church. It was a Presbyterian church that was at Plymouth and Meyer. I've never been to a Presbyterian church. I grew up Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. okay? But again, even, <clears throat> even there, the people were super friendly. Was it because they were church goers? Who knows? My first job was there at the church. You know, I, I did work there. I, I was a, a, a leader in the summer program that they put on for the neighborhood kids. You know, all of, as a matter of fact, you know one of the neighborhood kids that um that was part of the summer program. Cynthia, who's now an attorney. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, as a matter of fact, I didn't even know she became a police officer. Wow. One day I ran into her downtown. And she goes, hey, Dell, how you doing? And we talked for a bit. And then she told me she was a Detroit police officer. And I go, really? She goes like, yeah. She goes, I remember those days back at Ward Church. And I remember when sometimes you'd come back in your uniform. She goes, and that's what inspired me to become a police officer. Wow. You know, so wow. again, you never know the, the, the effect you're going to have on people. Right. So you always be nice to a person. Yes. Because it all, it seems to always work out. I've got couple of stories like that where you did what you're supposed to do and it turned out right and the people come and thank you later. You yeah, know, you got so. influence. <laughs> yeah. That's good. But as for the kids and school, I don't think they've had that issue. Um, again, I think kids are more tolerant today. Um, I remember times I'd have seven or eight kids here in the house and they're all playing video games. And they're all they're black, they're white, they're Asian, mm -hmm. you know, and they're all here and they're having a ball, right. you know. So I don't think that was an issue for them at all. Um, when I first got to the Paw Paw Post, that was an issue for me. Um, oh. Growing up in the islands, the money was mostly held by the white folks. However, the power the legislative power um, and everything else was held by the black folks. Kind of a difference. So we were never really oppressed um, when it came to like, you know, slavery because we were brought there as slaves mm -hmm. to work in the, the sugarcane fields. We were free long before the African Americans and the blacks here were free. We fought for our freedom. We revolted down there in the Korea. And we, bur we, we burned the, the king fields mm. and we got our freedom. The governor or the, from um, Denmark, who were on the Danish rule at the time, signed a, a decree that says, hey, <laughs> that's enough of that. You guys are free, mm -hmm. you know? So growing up, I never really had the experience of being oppressed by white people. Mm -hmm. So when I came here to Michigan at first, you know, I'd, hear, I'd hear Blacks talk about that. You know, yeah, there's white people there, some white people that, and I'm standing there a little confused as to, well, I never really experienced that because that's not how it was in the islands. Mm -hmm. But as time went on, I got to, I got some sense of it because then I started experiencing some of it. And some of it was very subtle. I remember when I got to the Paw Paw Post and I was, if I'm not mistaken, the first black they ever sent to the Paw Paw Post. And I remember asking one of my training officers a couple of years later, I says, why did you send me to Paw Paw? You know, he says, for two reasons. One, because you have a personality that seems to be able to get along with anyone. And two, you speak Spanish. And there are a lot of migrant workers over there. And I go, oh, at least I know now the logic behind it. But when I got to the post, I was there a couple of months. And I remember one of my sergeants, said to me, you're going to go far in this department. And I go, oh, why is that, sir? He goes, you don't speak like other Black people. Now, that's a subtle racist comment. Yes, it is. <laughs> but it was racist. Yes. You know? And, but I also had a, uh, 
a white side. They were all white, but I was the only black person other than the one family that lived in the area. I also had another sergeant who was my first financial advisor. I remember we were sitting at a bar one evening and he leans over and I was only there maybe a couple of months. He leans over to me and says, are you in this um, savings plan with the department? And I go, no. He goes, get it. And that's an order. The time you just follow the rules. If it wasn't for him, I don't think I'd be in the financial situation I'm in today. You know, I remember when he passed, I went to his funeral. And his son came up to me because, again, I was the, the only flying the, uh, in, in the cream there. <laughs> his son came up to me and says, oh, how do you know my dad? You know, and that's why I introduced him. I said, like, he was my first financial advisor, and I have to thank him. That's why I'm here. You know, so. so not everybody was that way. Some people were. I had one trooper out there also. Um, I was there a couple of weeks, and I was sitting on a report or something like that, and he says, hey, spear chucker. <laughs> what? Know? Spear chucker. Okay. And I go, you talking to me? <laughs> He's like, yeah. I go, well, first of all, I've never thrown a spear in my life, <laughs> you know, so don't call me spear chucker, you know. He said, oh, I'm sorry, Matt. Okay, you know. And about a month later, they named him my tra one of my training officers, you know. But again, once he got to know me, we became best friends. Okay. He, he taught me how to play tennis. He gave me my first set of golf clubs. He would, I could go home to his house and sit with his wife and kids and have dinner, okay. you know. But again, it all, it all depends on how that person is, how open-minded they are. Right. You know, because they can see you as, as a skin color mm -hmm. and go, well, he's just like all of them or they're all alike. You know, the right. old typical stereotype, you know. But when they get to know the person, and I think that's very important in the world today. You know, you see people out there, you go like, just talk to the person. Right. See what they're like. And yeah, if you, you don't have to like them, right. you know, but at least be civil to them. And that's all, just a matter of civility. Yes, yes. So. so for the most part, would you say that your young adults are just uh, people who have parents of different races and they just encounter the same routine issues that any other uh, race, a kid of any other race would have? And it's just... The person yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure they have experienced or come across some racial issues, uh -huh. you know, in their young adult years. Um, they've never mentioned them to me like, hey, dad, guess what happened to me today? Okay. You know, because I think they're independent enough and, and can think for themselves to work around those issues on their own without getting me involved because okay. you don't want me involved. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, so I think they just work those things out themselves. I mean, like my daughter, her boyfriend is white. Great kid. Great kid. I mean, he even brought me over some jambalaya and cornbread that he made the other night. You know, wow. this kid's from, he, he lives in Livonia, you know. My son, his current girlfriend, um, she's a young black lady, you know. Mm -hmm. But again, they're fine. They So again, they're, they intermix the races today. They they're just I don't think they experienced the full blown racism that was going on 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like even in the Michigan State Police, mm -hmm. they've been around for ages. They didn't have their first black officer until the, the late 60s. Wow. Yeah. And they're still white predominant. Well, on that, we're going to take a quick break. But stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back. This Father's Day, celebrate the dad in your life with a special event. And come on down to the Rooster Tail, located in downtown on the beautiful Detroit River, for a Father's Day luncheon that he won't forget. There'll be great food. There'll be giveaways. There'll be prizes and outstanding entertainment. So stop searching and go online to eventbrite.com. That's eventbrite.com. And look for our Father's Day luncheon at the Rooster Tail. Get your tickets now. All right, 
right, welcome back everybody to Real Dad Speak. We're here again with Dale Christian uh, with our interview talking about biracial children raised by different parents with different races. So um, we're getting down to our final five, which is my portion where I ask five final questions to my guest. And um, I'll start off with this one. Number one, what lesson has your dad taught you that you have passed along to your children? Uh, that's a good question, Sarah. One of the things my father told me, again, like I said, my mom handled the purse strings. One of the things he always told me was, no matter who you are, be sure that you can pay all the bills yourself. Okay. So you might split bills and all that stuff when you're married or have a girlfriend, but be sure that you can do it all on your own because that other person may not always be there. Wow, good advice. And I imparted that to both of my kids. You know, I said, hey, you know, you got your boyfriends and you got your girlfriends and this, that, and the other. You guys move again together and so forth. That's fine. Split the bills, split the rent. But know that if you break up, you don't have to lower your standard. Get right. used to a certain standard of living, but off of your own money. That way, you, that doesn't change. You know, mm -hmm. you so that you don't fall into a trap of, Oh my gosh, now I can't live here anymore. Or no, I can't afford this car anymore. Right. Be able to do all that on your own. If you can't do it on your own money, don't do it. Okay. Don't do it because you really can't afford it if something happens. So that was the biggest lesson I think my dad taught me. Okay. All right. Question number two. Um, do you think that dad should communicate with their children, be honest, playful, uh, and dependable, like be there in good times and bad times for them? Should you be able to talk and allow them to bring up subjects that may be, I guess, kind of touchy? Like, for instance, when you and your wife got divorced, was that a topic that they could ask you questions about and you didn't say go ask your mother or you sat there and you guys talked about it together? You know, we sat him down and told them that we were getting divorced. Um, of course, my daughter cried. My son kind of looked like, why? <laughs> you know, one of those kind of things. And that's a, another story in itself. But um, but no, you have to be able to communicate that with the kids. And in this case, we let them know it's got nothing to do with you guys. This is mm -hmm. between your mom and I. You guys are fine. Um, we are we are friends. I mean, you know, their mom and I were friends still. Um, matter of fact, when we got divorced, she only moved like about a little more than a quarter of a mile away, maybe a half a mile. So the kids were old enough then that they could walk back and forth to each each house. You know, one of those kind of things. And we we went we went right down the middle with time sharing for the kids. You know, she'd have them one week, I'd have them another. We didn't want to do the weekend thing and. We wanted a little bit of stability, so we went for the whole week at a time, you know. And I, I think that worked out well. But yes, you have to be able to talk to your kids about sensitive matters. You still have to be able to joke around with your kids. Just this past Saturday, I was playing. I was out playing pickleball, and I called my daughter because her boyfriend lives about three blocks from where we were playing pickleball. I called her in the morning, and I go like, "Hey, I'm going to be over at the pickleball court. Um, if you and um KJ want to come over and watch, you know." She goes. Dad, I don't know. We're not interested in pickleball. I said, well, come on over anyway if you feel like it. She goes, well, we'll see. So about 11 o'clock, they walk over, and the other people were there, and they says, oh, well, you guys want to play? You want to try it? No, no. Oh, come on, try it. They tried it. They played. We even played a game with them. We gave some of the rules to them. Everybody else left. The only three people left were those two and I. <laughs> I decide, okay, you can keep the paddles, and here's a ball. You guys can knock it around as much as you want. And KJ turns and says, well, I think I'm going to go get me a paddle. Wow. You know, but again, that's having fun with them, you wow. know, and, and and exposing them to new things, you know. Yes. Everybody thinks pickleball is an old person sport. No, it's not. It's not. No, it's not. But again, you got to have fun with it. My son and I, we bowl together. Okay. You know, he bowls. Um, I sub on one of his teams. He subbed on one of my teams. And last year, we bowled on the same team together. Okay. So, yeah, so we're out there. We're having fun. We're communicating. And we, we're enjoying each other's company, you know. So, yeah, it's important to, to talk to them. That's good. 
Okay, what do you think people misunderstand about biracial families? The more do you think the most thing that they misunderstood about families like yours? I, I, what do they misunderstand most? I think, I think the most thing they misunderstand is that there are issues that the they have to deal with, and the issues only develop because of that other person. They're just normal people, you right. know? And if it wasn't for someone else creating an issue, there would be no issue. They're kids. You know, you, you see kids, one year old, two years old, three, four years old. They don't care what the other kid looks like. They're no. playing. They're having fun, you know? That only develops later on when a parent or a grandparent starts to put a little more influence on them. Mm -hmm. They don't care. So the, the issue develops from someone else, right. not from the biracial family, not from the biracial kids. It's an outside influence that causes the issues. Yeah. All right. I think this is number four. Um, fill in this blank. My children would describe me as fill in the blank. <laughs> Uh, let's see. How would my daughter describe me? My daughter would probably describe me as a disciplinarian, a teacher, and cool. <laughs> cool? And cool. A cool disciplinarian. That's what you... Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, even like her friends, you know, I've always said, man, you got the coolest dad, you know? I don't do anything special. I laugh with her friends. I joke with her friends. You know, yeah, whatever. My son, I think he would describe me as as strong, opinionated, and 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 also a teacher because I try to get I I try to instill in especially financial things. You know how to handle their money, um, how to handle their life. You know stuff like that. I try to get get drill into them so that they are a better than I when that time comes for them to retire. Like my son, I started him saving with a Roth IRA from the time he was 14. Wow. You know, and he still puts money into it. He's been working ever since he was 16. Even going to high school, he ran track, everything else, but he was still working. He'd worked his weekends, and then as time went on, he worked full time. And it was at a bowling alley, but they loved him there. They mm -hmm. started as a, a working, you know, doing the parties on the weekends for kids and stuff like that. Then they made him a pin jumper. Then they made him a mechanic. Then they asked him if he wanted to stick around in the summertime. So he stuck around in the summertime there and was doing machine repairs on the bowling pins. Then come season, he said, like, you want to go to the kitchen? So then he started cooking in the kitchen at the bowling alley. So, yeah, he's and now he's, you know, he's got a degree in computer science. Okay. So what's he doing? Selling patio furniture. That's, <laughs> you, <know? laughs> <laughs> you know, what, hey. Go figure, right? That's go okay. Figure. That's neither here nor there. That's, that's our issue. <laughs> you know, so. And, and my daughter, yes, again, you know, she's always been into makeup. Always been into skincare and stuff like that. She'd be here in high school, and her girlfriends would come over, and she'd be doing all their makeup to go to prom, to go to this party, go to that party. And I say to her, "Are you charging them anything for this? You know, five dollars even?" She goes like, "Nah, Dad, they're my friends." I so you should at least charge them a couple bucks, you know. So she started doing that, and so she made her money that way. Now she does aesthetics for a uh, company in um in Canton. And that's what she does for her living. You know, but that was what something she had always been into. So I always wanted to pursue their dreams, do what you want to do, you know. But as for Delson, patio furniture, come on. <laughs> <laughs> choices, Dad. You told them to have choices, so they did. <laughs> yeah. All right. So my final question. What's the best advice you have ever received and what's the best advice you've ever given to well I guess what's the best advice you would give to a new dad or another dad but what's the best advice you receive about being a dad the best advice I would give to a new father is to be there for your kids 
I mean, and when I say be there, I don't mean just be at home. I mean, be there, participate in their activities. And one of the things I try to do with my kids is make them very well grounded. So I had them participate in every sport they could when they were younger. Golf lessons, swimming, soccer, t-ball, everything. Well-rounded people. I love sports, so that's probably why I had him do all that. <laughs> anyway, but and but I would say just be there for the kids. And when they're doing their thing, you got to be there. You know, when when Delson was playing on um, T ball, I was one of the assistant coaches. You know, when when Delaney was at oh, was was taking golf lessons, I I showed up there all the time. She started doing. She didn't the school they went to. You either had to do music or sing in the school in the fifth grade. You had you had no choice, one or the other. Play an instrument or sing. Well, Delaney chose an instrument. She chose a saxophone. One of my best friends had three saxophones. He gave her one. So she played saxophone all through her elementary school. Got to high school, went, did the marching band thing, played saxophone in the marching band for two years. Then decided, well, Dad, I don't think I want to do the marching band anymore. So she moved over to color guard. That's fine with me. But in her sophomore year, as she's playing saxophone, we had to get some private lessons, you know, try to make the best that you can for them. And the one, her instructor says, uh, hey, listen, there's a guy down in Lincoln Park, owns a music store, has a little band. He says, um, all kids, you want to come down and play? And she goes, well, I don't know. I said, oh, I think it'd be fun. So I drove her down to Lincoln Park this one day. And we get there a little bit early because, yeah, I was early. And he goes in and he says, just go in this back room and just warm up a little bit. She's back there playing and you can tell she's nervous, you know. And then the guy comes in and he's talking to her. And she comes out and says, Dad, I want to go home. I go, now, I drove 20 plus miles down here. You're going to stay here and finish this out. If you don't want to come back after that, that's fine. But you're staying here at least today. I left and went to a micro boot down the street, right? So about an hour and a half later, I came back and they're in there playing and she's laughing and she's joking. <laughs> and I go, well, you coming back next week? She goes, back, yeah, dad, that was fun. <laughs> so they, they have this little band. The, the youngest kid was nine and I think the oldest girl was like 15. And he would set gigs up for them and they would go play at fairs, local wow. fairs. They played at a bar one night. And I go up, you know, I drop her off. I go park. She goes in. I get to the door. And I, I the guy says, $5 cover charge. I says, no, I, my daughter's in the band. He goes, well, how do you think they're going to get paid? You know, <laughs> so again, you be there for them. Just right. participate with them, laugh with them, joke with them, discipline them when they need it, you know. But you have to be there for them. both parents, not just one. Both of them need to be there. All right, so what's the best advice you were given to be the well, dad that you are? Well, the best advice, I, I guess, I guess they have to be the two things I mentioned before. One from my sergeant that told me to get into this investment thing. And the second thing from my dad when he said, be sure you can live on your own money. And again, I've imparted both of those things to my kids. Uh, my daughter, she hasn't bit the, the investment portion of it yet. <laughs> You know, but my son has, which is good. But she kept saying, I know that, I know I'm going to get um, one of her uncles is actually a, a financial planner. I go, he goes, she goes, I know that, I know I'm, I'm calling him, I'm calling him. Okay, well, when you do, you know, but um, but again, like, I wish she works now, she gets a bonus every month. And I go, what are you going to do with your bonus? She goes, I don't know. I says, you know, that's probably a good thing that you could start the investment with is the bonus you get every month because. It's extra money that you don't need and you don't count on because it changes every month. Right. You don't even count on it. You may not get it one month. I think you should just invest that. We'll see how we'll see what happens. You all <laughs> you can do is tell them, give right. them the lesson, and hope they do. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure and a joy. Thank oh, you so much. Pleasure. It's a pleasure and a joy to be here with you, sir. And um, and I appreciate the fact that you contacted me for your podcast about being a dad. Um, I think that's one of the proudest things a man can do is be a dad, not a father, a dad. Right. Yes. Um, I know uh, 
several kids that their fathers were never around. I, I even had one in my life for over 12 years. Wow. He was another story, but um, but yeah, but he, he lived with us for a while. Um, his mom and I dated for a while, not up to that long while, you know, but um, you know, for over 10 years and stuff like that. But he became like my second son. You know, and he just graduated from Eastern Michigan with his degree in uh, music education. Wow. So, so, again, another thing, you know, you just, you're glad that you can influence people. You're glad you can guide them along and uh, and then see how good they turn out and be good citizens. Yes. In general. Yes. But thanks again for the opportunity to be here and share my story. Thank you for accepting. I only try, I only try to uh, to interview the best. You know, I only want the best. So well, thank you're you. one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and and right. you know, you are the best. Thank you, Dale. All right, we'll talk soon. I love you. I love and you. Thank, too. And one. thanks for sharing. All right, you're welcome. Right. This Father's Day, celebrate the dad in your life with a special event, and come on down to the Rooster Tail, located in downtown on the beautiful Detroit River for a Father's Day luncheon that he won't forget. There'll be great food, there'll be giveaways, there'll be prizes, and outstanding entertainment. So stop searching and go online to eventbrite.com. That's eventbrite.com. And look for our Father's Day luncheon at the Rooster Tail. Get your tickets 